Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of exciting things going on at, um, at the NNSS. Now, uh, I have to tell you, I will slip and call it the test site. Okay, can we just, can we just move on? I'll, I'll just admit my, my, my sin there and let's just move on from there. It's going to be the test site tonight because that's, that's what we've always known and loved it for. But we will point out tonight why, why it is the Nevada National Security Site. So let's go ahead. Let's go to the next slide. So I wanted to give you uh, some perspectives on where we are with the, with the Nevada National Security Site, a.k.a. the test site. Next slide, please. Um, Keep going there. All right, so a little bit of history, you know, of the, of the test site. In, uh, in, the 1950, in 1950, um, the, the, then the Nevada Proving Grounds was designated as the, as the site where we were going to do uh, testing for a number of reasons that I won't, I'm not going to go into tonight. But uh, around that time, uh, the decision was made to use the Nevada test site as as the place where we would do uh, at that time above ground above ground testing and later on went to all the underground testing of of what i 'll call integrated plutonium ex or, or nuclear weapons experiments the first one in one thousand nine hundred and fifty one it 's interesting um, you know darwin is here he 's the uh, he 's my historian, but he says that between being designated and the first test was 45 days. It was 45 days. Today we couldn't get the <laughs> couldn't get the first pi five pages of the paperwork done, and so it's truly remarkable, truly remarkable uh, things that went on uh, there. And so tests were conducted until um, above ground tests were conducted until 1962, and then they went underground. Um, there were approximately 100 tests above ground, and then we went underground, and then. Um, between 61 and, and uh, 1992, 800 and some odd um, underground tests were, were performed out out there. Uh, a couple of interesting factoids. The the um, let's see here. Where is the thing I'm looking for? Oh yeah, if you added up the 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 length of all the holes that were drilled and are out there, it's, it's over 280 miles of. Uh, Vertical shafts and, and horizontal shafts that were drilled, quite quite impressive. Uh, you know, really, a feat of engineering and, and effort that went on there. Um, let's go to the next slide. So let's you know a couple things happened uh, you know as as you as we move forward. Um, the end of the Cold War really started to change uh, the thinking and the approach of the United States, and there were two key things that happened uh, under. Um, under uh, President Bush, uh, there was a you know the decision was made was made to reduce the number of of weapons in the stockpile, as well as the decision to make to no longer ha create new types of nuclear weapons, which started to, basically what that did is eliminate competition between the laboratories. The laboratories would compete with each other. The joke, which is not so much of a joke, is the enemy of Los Alamos and the enemy of Livermore was not the Soviet Union. The enemy of Livermore was Los Alamos, and the enemy of Los Alamos was Livermore, and uh, and uh, that the, the competition there was actually quite intense and and uh, and well fought out, and I you know that was something that I think enabled the nation to uh, to achieve what it what it did. Um, so that that made a change, and that and that's fundamental uh, to how to to why we got to where we are today. The, end, the other one was the, uh, the moratorium where we agreed in, in 1992 to no longer conduct uh, underground uh, uh, experiments. And, uh, and so that, uh, those th two things happened. And so that, uh, that left us with a, a conundrum. How do you continue to ensure the safety, security, and reliability? Remember, reliability uh, refers to the deterrent nature of, of, the, of the stockpile. And uh, and people thought that was still important. Um, and so, what do you, what do you do? Well, there was a. Let's go to the next slide. There was some there were some very interesting, clever people that that thought their way through this. And uh, unfortunately, I don't see his picture on here. But one of the people was a guy named Vic Reese, 
you know, out of, that was brought in to start thinking about this. And he, along with some of the laboratory leaders and uh, the scientists at the laboratories, came up with a concept called stockpile, I'm saying, I'm sorry, science-based stockpile stewardship. And uh, the whole idea here was to, uh, to basically use, to, to d dive deeper, in fact, to, down to the fundamental level uh, of understanding of how these weapons worked and model those in, in, on computers and then use that to continue to validate the safety, security, and reliability of, of the stockpile. And so that created a couple challenges. It, it created a, a, a need to better understand the physics and, and the performance ca uh, ca characteristics um, of, of a weapon while, you know, because you're going to have to model that on a computer. It also meant that um, the computational power that w existed at that time uh, was nowhere near enough to be able to really do the kind of fi fine detail that you needed to do to truly understand and, and characterize these, these weapons in, in, in such a way that you could, uh, you could ensure not only our nation, but the rest of the world that, that our, our, our stockpile, our, our deterrent, was going to do what it was going to do. So, um, so the, the, the whole idea, what, what ended up happening is that two very strong efforts went into a really diving deep into understanding the science behind uh, or that uh, was fundamental to weapon performance as well as driving supercomputing. And so um, since that time, I, really the NNSA has been the leader with supercomputing and we're not far away now from exascales computing. That, that, that's really the next next big uh, release of, of computing. So um, you can kind of you see there a picture from of Charlie Vern, I'm not Charlie Vern, Charlie McMillan on the bottom of getting to over a million uh, times the com computational power. Um, and then uh, a picture of one of the great designers, um, Seymour Sack, uh, um, somebody I was able to work with a little bit. And uh, as they define the goals and they define how we're going to move forward, interestingly enough, as a sidebar, were, were somebody decide, oh, well, let's go back and let's resume testing, you know, the laboratories would say, okay, but I still need to do the stockpiles. I still need to do science-based stockpile stewardship because that's really what has brought us to the level where we understand the, the, the performance of weapons today. So let's go to the next slide. Um, one of the key things of, of building computer models that we're going to be used to, uh, to validate uh, the, the, the performance of these weapons is that it had to be benchmarked. You couldn't just simply have a, a, a computer model, and I'll, I'll talk maybe a little bit more about this later. Um, uh, you know, we had, there were theories of how uh, the, the materials would perform. Remember that you're going from something that's at room temperature, and in many cases is going to be uh, very cold, below room temperature, to temperatures that uh, you can think of in excess of the uh, the core of the sun and pressures even more so. And so th it, it isn't like you could go to, a, 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 to your local library, your local engineering uh, manuals and pull out perf you know, uh, data that would tell you how the material behaves under these very high temperatures, pressures, and strain rates. Um, we had to actually do the testing. We had to do testing that would validate the computer models. And one of the things I did, uh, Early, well, early in my career, mid mid career, but um, as I was I was involved, I'll show you a little bit more about this at, at Jasper, where we were desperately trying to get uh, equation of state and constitutive properties of plutonium, and both Livermore and Los Alamos had had computer models. They didn't agree, um, but they had computer models. And uh, what I ask people is, I say, well, okay, we shot Jasper, we got the data, we get we, with such precision that uh, it ans actually answered the question of who was right. And so I, I would tell people, I'm, from, I'm an ex-Livermore guy, and I'd have my former deputy from Los Alamos, and I'd say, well, who was right? And he thought I was going to say, say Los Alamos. The answer is neither one. Both, of, both, both, both laboratories had to change, or it changed their, understand, or their thoughts on what the models were really looking like. And so, so that's what was going on here is that we, ha we had to get data to support and, and to drive the physics understanding behind why weapons behave the way they, they did. And that's been phenomenally successful. And key to that has been 
the Nevada test site. This is the place where we, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is the place where we validate the, um, the codes in a, lot, in a lot of ways. There are, other, there are other places, but we're the place where they can really put it all together and make sure it's all working. So in, in the recent nuclear posture review, um, the decision was made to, uh, or, or with the review, they, they, they came up with some, uh, some overarching principles and things that they needed to continue with. So number one, remember what I said is that there's no new weapons. In the absence of new weapons, what we do is something that's called life extension programs. You take an existing weapon and you refurbish it and, and you try to refresh it to the point that you've extended its life, a life extend, extension program. And so those are going to continue. And that was something. Um, the other thing, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, is that in the absence of, um, as we went through this change from you know, empirical based in a lot of ways of the, the testing program to the science based talk about stewardship, um, the funding and, and the support of that was, was, was somewhat, um, was challenged a lot. And so over the last, uh, I would say over the last decade, there's been, um, a lack of investment in, uh, in the complex. And so today, one of the things that the Nuclear Posture Review has pointed out is that we need to refurbish and upgrade our infrastructure. And that's, that's something that's gonna be really, that we'll say, is, you know, I'll, I'll talk about later, is that something that is coming to Nevada uh, and that we, we, we get a, a fairly significant piece of that pie. And then uh, the other thing is we needed to be able to maintain the experimental capabilities and actually expand them. And that's that expansion of those material of the, of, the, um, of the capabilities that is so exciting for us here in Nevada today. And I'll show some of those later. And so as you put together this history and where we are today and what the Nuclear Posture Review has done is we see a lot of opportunity and growth as we go forward. And so that, that sort of sets the baseline or the foundation of what I want to talk about today. So let's go to the next, hit the next slide and just go ahead and hit the next one. So where we are today. Let me take a step back and, and say who I am and who, who or what our company is that, that runs this today. So we have the Department of Energy, a semi-autonomous part of that is the National Nuclear Security Administration, the NNSA. The NNSA has, uh, you know, oversees the laboratories, the plants, and they say the laboratories, plants, and sites. Well, it's laboratory, plant, and site. We are the site, okay? And so we are the Na Nevada National Security site that is really operated or overseen, if you will, by the Nevada Field Office. That, those are the feds that, are, uh, that, are, that, that manage or oversee the work that's going on at the Nevada Security Site. We are mission support and test services. Um, we're, the, we're the contractor that basically does the work or is the operator at the Nevada test site. And so that's the hierarchy and who we are. Um, we took over, uh, let's see, a year ago, December. So what's that, 16 months? Something like that. Um, we, we came here and uh, have some of my colleagues here, raise your hands, the, you know, the MSTS people. It's the only way, we had to fill the seats somehow, so I told them they had to come. Um, that's who we are and like, how long we've been here. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So, the, the, I kind of laughingly say, there's only, um, if you think about the Nevada Na National Security site, there's only Two, wor two of the words that actually make sense, if you, take, if you look at it, and that's national security. And I'm, I'm gonna keep coming back to that. Because our sites do not all, all our, our operations are not all in Nevada, okay? And because of that, we're clearly not a site, because we're all, we're, we're sort of uh, the, um, the national security sites, if you will. But anyway, you can see that we have, I'll, I'll step up here, try not to fall off, but we, we have the, um, the site itself, if you, if you see it out at Mercury, you, as you're driving out 95, you see the Mercury and it says no services, so don't get off. Um, but you have the, the security site itself, the, otherwise known as the test site. 
Then we have where where my offices are, and most of us are at the at the out on Losi Road. You see the old uh, um, the, for my Los Alamos brethren here, the racklet, the assembly for the racklets. I call it a canister. Um, but uh, we have uh, out at the out at North Las Vegas, we have the uh, where the test tower is. We have a lot of our offices, and we have some experimental capabilities there. We also um, you'll see some of the spin-offs that have come from all the technologies that have been worked on and developed over the years are are helping in other areas. So I'm, I'm going to come back to this at the end of my talk, but we have the remote sensing laboratory that's actually on Nellis Air Force Base. Okay. Um, I won't mention this l th later, so I'll hit it now. The remote sensing laboratory is, is, is really not a good name for it because it's far more than the remote sensing laboratory. We actually run the emergency communication network out there as well. Okay, so for, for the DOE, we, we operate that emergency uh, communications network as well as doing the remote sensing. Uh, because of the need to be closely coupled with one of the laboratories, Livermore, we have Livermore operations, uh, as well as we have for the other uh, weapons laboratories, we have the Los Alamos uh, operations as well as Sandia operations. So we, ha you know, it helps us stay closely coupled with the, uh, with the, the, the people that are going to be fielding and executing work out here at the, the site. Additionally, we have uh, the Special Technologies Laboratory, which is in Santa Barbara. Interesting history behind that, won't have time for it today, but basically it's there, um, it's tightly coupled with the UC uh, Santa Barbara, the University of California, Santa Barbara, and has some history behind that. They, that's the old e, where the old EG&G uh, was working, and they did a lot of the um, diagnostic cameras and things like that. Very, very interesting work. Uh, unfortunately, I won't have time to get into very much of that t today. Additionally, on the East Coast, see, I got all these. Yeah, I don't want to forget somebody. On the East Coast, we have a, a sister remote sensing laboratory at the Andrews Air Force Base. Um, it, it is, uh, if you're ever on the mall and you see a helicopter or plane flying over the mall, it's probably ours. Okay, so we're, we're out there. We're doing uh, um, sensing work out there as well. And then little known, we have a small operation, the Counterterrorism Support Program um, that's up in, in New York, up on Long Island. Um, it's not really big, but um, we, we also do the CTOS work here, uh, but for some very obvious reasons, there's, a, there's a, a, a location that we're working, that does work for, for New York, and it's close to the city of New York, and, and I'll just say right now, New York is very possessive of that. Um, when I went out to visit there, the chief of police and showed up and wanted to make sure that I was supportive, and he was had a gun on his holster. So, uh, yes, sir, whatever you'd like. Um, let's go to the next slide. So a um, couple things that people should know, uh, just as a diversion from some of the technical things. Um, we employ about uh, 3,000 people, a total about 2,700 people in, uh, in Nevada here. We represent about a billion dollars worth of um, financial investment in, in, this, in southern Nevada. Pretty significant. A lot of people don't know that, but it's about a billion dollars. And, all, and that's, that's doing nothing but growing. And so uh, um, we think we're a positive um, uh, business partner in the community here. Uh, a lot of things are, you know, about $50 million worth of expenditures here. Um, our total replacement value, if you had to replace it, you know, $3.5 billion. Um, and then uh, also not well known is that part of the work that we're, part of the things that we do is uh, results in um, monies being given to some of the counties around here uh, for, um, they've been able to uh, take those monies and buy emergency response equipment uh, and things like that. So we're supporting a lot of the counties around here as well. Um, little known fact, uh, if on Highway 95, uh, out in Mercury, which is right on Highway, Highway 95, we have, uh, you know, we have uh, our site there and we have a fire department right there at the, at the gate. And it's our biggest fire department. Uh, we have one in more forward areas, but it's, it's about half the size of the one we have up front. What we respond to most there is off-site accidents on Highway 95. So, um, Again, we try to be good members of the community with that. And so we're the largest high-tech employer in Southern Nevada. Let's go to the next slide. 
Um, so back to the mission. So we, again, we're about ensuring the safety of the United States and its allies. And this is done, as I mentioned, through stockpile stewardship. We do defense and nuclear nonproliferation. Think about that as more of the homeland security versus the you know, difference between the Defense Department and the Homeland Security. One is, as you can imagine, you know, the um, national security or the stockpile stewardship is about our <coughs> nuclear weapons. Uh, defense nonproliferation is ensuring that others, we don't, you know, we try to understand and see what other states are able to do. Nuclear incident response, little known fact, before 360,000 people descend on the strip, uh, for New Year's Eve, we're out there and we're surveying and we're doing everything we can to make sure that this community here is safe. We do the same thing. That's why we fly them all, and we do other we do other things. We were the people that responded up in Beatty, and so we're we again we we're we're under the radar screen a lot of these things a lot of these areas, but we do we we take our technologies and try to make them useful to people. Uh, national security partnerships, you can read into that, we, you know, if the military or other organizations can take advantage of our facilities and our site. Remember, on our site, we're about the size of the state of Rhode Island, uh, and we control our land and our airspace, and that makes us somewhat unique. Um, and so there are a lot of times that people like to uh, like to do some work there. We can, we can put them off the grid or we can put them on uh, wherever they need to be. And so our, we try to work collaboratively and cooperatively with other organizations. And we do a small amount of environmental management. Let's go to the next slide. So let's get back into the core mission of the uh, weapons work. So again, just sort of refreshing where I've been. We do experimental work out here that is intended to validate the, the, uh, the, the codes that are put in, you know, that are being used in our advanced computing. And so two things that are Nevada specific, SCE is subcritical experiments. I'll talk more about what that is here in a little bit. And then we do at some actinide science. That's a picture of the Jasper uh, primary target chamber. And we'll actually show you a little video of that because that one's, uh, that's one we can talk and we can show you a lot about what's going on. All of these things, whether you know this is a Z machine, uh, can get you fundamental data. It's in Albuquerque. You got NIF that uh, gets you the high end, very high, the high temperature, high pr pressure uh, regime. It's in California. Livermore Dart is at Los Alamos, and then uh, the advanced computing. It's you know each each one of the laboratories has the supercomputers, and and so they run their code, but it's all ba it's all being validated through these uh, above ground and, and in some cases below ground experimental uh, facilities. And so it all comes together to cert into certifying life extension and the work that's going on to ensure that. I like this chart, and this is a bit of a diversion, but I, I wanted to make sure it, it got in here. This is time. So, you know, this is the year, so here's year 2000, that's your year 1600, and this is the percent of population um, that were fatalities due to warfare, okay? So in the early days, you know, we were hacking at each other, about 2.27% of the people were dying from warfare. Uh, it got better, dropped down to 1.15, uh, 1.13, and then World War I happened, and, and then uh, that was the war to end all wars, and then it went up to 1.75, World War II, and uh, um, then the nuclear, the atomic bomb and the nuclear weaponry appeared, and it's dropped precipitously down to 0.4%. I, I don't know this. I don't know this at all, but you could imagine, absent some, if, you know, if that didn't work, if, if, uh, if the deterrence didn't work, you could only imagine where that, where that would have gone. And so we're pretty passionate about the fact that uh, this is national security and, and we're about making this world actually a better place. So let's go to the next slide. So subcritical experiments, let's talk about those a little bit. Um, this is what replaces the underground testing, okay? We don't do underground uh, full-up nuclear testing anymore. We do subcritical experiments and we base 
a, a lot of what is, is uh, used to validate the codes is coming out of here. So it's replaced the underground testing. When we say subcritical experiments, it makes total sense to many of us. It makes no sense to most of the world, though. <laughs> so what that means is that you're not achieving a criticality. A criticality, think of it simply as that's where the energy might come from uh, or is going to come from uh, when you start releasing nuclear energy. And so you have to go critical and then supercritical uh, to get that energy release. And so we don't achieve those criticalities. We're able to do our work without getting that ex nuclear explosion uh, energy. So they're subcritical. Um, and, and we're able, you know, very clever scientists and experimentalists are, you know, figured these things out, how to do this. And it was all part of this, this stockpile stewardship that, you know, was the thinking early on that, that really drove how we we're going to do this. But basically, it, it is used today to determine the state of health of weapons in our stockpile. And that's a safety issue. It could be a security issue. It could be a reliability issue. All those things are, val are, are validated through um, the work that we're doing out here. Um, as I mentioned many times already now, it provides data to validate and, and update computer models. We talked about that. One way to think about this is that each experiment takes years to put together and, uh, and hundreds of people to, put to, to execute it. So, so one thing we're really proud of is that um, there was uh, the subcritical experiments were, you know, early on they were happening, you know, one a year, one every year and a half or something like that. Then for some reasons that we don't need to go into here, there was a, there was a bit of a, of a gap, you know, multi-year gap. Today, right now, we have five subcritical experiments being worked simultaneously. And so, uh, the, the amount of work that is coming here is, is daunting for us. We, our biggest challenge today is the rapid growth and the, uh, uh, and the needs that the nation is asking of us to field and execute these experiments. And so they're in varied stages of their, of their life cycle, but it's a, it's a, as I say, the, the problems that we have today are good problems, they're great problems to have. It's exciting and it, and it motivates our, our people. So a lot of good things going on. Let's go to the next slide. So um, the, the place that we're doing the subcritical experiments is a place called U1A. Great name, right? U1A, what in the world does that mean? U means it's, it's an underground tunnel. <laughs> One means it's an area one, and A, it means it's the A shaft, which is interesting because we don't really use the A shaft anymore. So um, we need to, I mean, JC, we need to fix the name, okay? It's a, it's a terrible name, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, we need to come up with something like the, uh, um, you know, we can pick, our, uh, pick a famous person, the, the so-and-so Center for um, Experimental Validation of, of, you know, plutonium code or something like that. Um, but there's a, if you go there, it's about you're going to descend about um, 900. No, about nine. That's no, about 963 feet because the cable stretches and you go back down there. You get to the bottom, um, and uh, so you you start to ground. You drop about you, know, you drop, you descend about 963 feet, and uh, the 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 cart runs at about 600. Uh, feet per minute, so it takes about a minute and a half to get down. Um, you get on a, 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 a an industrial kind of elevator, and it, it lowers you down there. And uh, you just don't. The only thing, the only thing I warn people about is if you're claustrophobic, close your eyes. So, um, but uh, you know, thousand feet underground, um, you get there, and you. This is not an ideal picture because it looks industrial. But you see this one, these, you get into the laboratories and they're pristine. You would, you would think that you're in a high-end laboratory. Uh, dust is your enemy there because you have high energy experiments. You have lasers, you have things like that, optical systems. And so things are very clean. Um, and so, uh, you know, in, in some of the laboratories, are, you know, it's, it's, a, it's actually quite impressive. Um, so you have about a, what is it, 1.4 miles, and we're constantly, we're, we're back in the mining business. We're actually uh, creating 
uh, more tunnels under, underground uh, to create more. And I'll show you some of the things where, where we're headed. But you know, we're fully it's your underground fully functioning laboratories with the full diagnostic capabilities. And uh, obviously, when you're underground like this, high level of operational security. Okay, so uh, hard to hard to get at. Uh, so the, the facility enables the subcritical experiments. We've talked a lot about that, but some things that you might be looking for, uh, you know, as as the diagnostics advance, there are more things we can look at. As you can look at more things, you learn more about it. Every it seems like every diagnostic uh, in, in innovation comes along. They deploy it. And we go, wow, I didn't didn't expect that, and we learned something. So that's very very interesting. You can look at manufacturing effects or defects in some cases. So those are some things we're able to look at, and you're obviously able to look at the safety and security. Um, informs the uh, stockpile certification code validation. I think I bat passed a picture. How am I doing on time? I mean, what t let's see. I got time. Okay, so one of the earlier pictures, it, you know, this is a, an example of what, what we look at. Um, it, it, uh, can we go back? backwards easily. If I'd like to show you the picture. I blew right past it. It's on, um, yeah, it's uh, slide number seven. If you go to slide number seven, yep, right, there we go. Here is uh, a micrograph of plutonium, okay? Plutonium is not the green goop or that, you know, you saw in Batman or whatever. It's actually a, a, a metal, and uh, at least the kind we're interested in is a metal. It's, it, it looks a lot like tin. And it depends on, it's weird stuff, but if it's, if it's in a certain form, it's actually malleable. But what, what you're seeing here are helium bubbles that are starting to form in the lattice of the, uh, of the, of the plutonium uh, grain structure. So pl you know, plutonium is an alpha emitter. You know, what's an alpha particle? An alpha particle is a, is a um, get in front of this, I get the feedback, sorry about that. Um, Alpha, I mean, it's, it's like a helium atom. It just is missing some electrons. And so it emits the alpha particle. The, uh, it's easy to scavenge a couple electrons. So after some time, you, you, you get that alpha particle there, it becomes a helium atom, and then another one comes along. And after over time, you build up a helium bubble in, uh, in, in the matrix there. Well, over time, you could start to imagine, you know, simplistically a way to think about this is you take a metal and over, if, you, if this happens long enough, it turns into a foam because you get the helium bubbles everywhere. So that, that really affects the, uh, the, um, the how, how, you know, the, the, how the plutonium is going to ultimately perform. And so one of the things that we're looking at, we've been looking at, is how plutonium ages. Does it age gracefully? Does it not? And how does that, you know, how will that affect the performance and the reliability, safety, security of, of weapons? So we're able to do those kind of experiments and, and uh, help the scientists understand. So that's a real example of one of the things we can talk, at least talk about here, one of the things that, we're, that is key to, um, uh, to making sure that Stockpile safe, secure, and reliable. So anyway, let's go. Let's go forward. Whatever page we were on. Um, I think we go back. I think we're now going to be. Yeah, let's go to page uh, 17 if we can. Yeah, there we go. So this is one of the things we're just so excited about. You know, going forward. Um, this is the. Uh, you know, first of all, the, the subcriticals are, experiments are evolving. You kind of see first of all the current schedule. Um, I'll tell you. If we build in capability to do more, this is sort of pedal to the metal for us right now. If we have the capability to do more, listen, they'll take it. If we can do more experiments, the government will, I'm very confident that they'll do it. Um, we, we did some work early on and were able to increase the, the pace at which we could do some critical experiments and um, they, you know, immediately they filled in the, the experiments. And so we're very confident if we can do more, we will do more. But one of the things we're really excited about is this new capability that uh, is coming our way. Uh, that This is uh, a, a new capability that we're going to put underground at UNA. It's a linear accelerator. It's a big one. It allows us to do multi-pulses on axis. Um, uh, so that we can watch the evolution of the uh, of the implosion, very important, very interesting. We'll also have a um, 
Uh, I'll show this in a second. We, we will also put a, a neutron generating device here, give us a nice big flux of neutrons to help diagnose some things. And so we will, we will put ourselves um, uh, at the forefront of uh, doing this kind of, this kind of work um, uh, pretty quickly here. Uh, next couple of years, this thing will hopefully be deployed and we'll have it active. And it will be a f a fundamental to uh, the kind of work we're, we're doing. Um, but anyway, you get an idea that the, the kind of work that's going on. And the other kind of the other nice thing there is you see on the left-hand side, that is one of the laboratory areas underground. That's in the current, uh, um, where we do subcrits today. So you can see it's, you know, you don't see dirt, you don't see um, walls of a cave or anything like that. That's all, all shot created in nice and clean, painted, stainless steel, you know, just nice clean uh, uh, room there. So anyway, let's go to the next slide here. So um, uh, let's see, okay, so hmm, we're, we're gonna leave the subcrits, sorry about this, we'll, we'll come back to subcrits here in a little bit, but we're, we'll, uh, we'll hit Jasper. Um, so to kind of put things into uh, context here, we Jasper is the Joint Actinide Shock Experimental uh, Physics Joint Actinide Shock Physics Experimental Research. I claim one of the worst acronyms ever. It was a result of a uh, of a competition. That's the best people could do. Um, so I'll show you a little uh, a little video about this. But basically, this is the place where we um, we were able to. Uh, um, validate that neither laboratory had their plutonium equation of state right. And they, um, they were able to do that. So let's go to the next slide. Um, this is a little video that we're gonna run. So if you can click on the video, yeah. The following animation of a JASPER experiment shows how the two-stage gas gun creates unique physical conditions important to the nation's stockpile stewardship program. A 10-pound piston is inserted into the gun's breech to be followed by a gunpowder assembly filled with standard military propellant. This assembly will provide the driving force to push the piston down the pump tube. After the breech plug is installed, the breech is sealed. From the control room, a firing pulse is sent to the breech gun. This pulse starts a series of events that ignite the propellant. The pressure within the breech reaches more than 500 atmospheres. As the piston accelerates down the pump tube, the hydrogen gas is compressed and heated, creating the driving force for the second stage of the gas gun. At the end of the pump tube, the piston reaches the end of the acceleration reservoir, which gradually reduces in diameter, thus increasing the gas pressure. When the compressed gas reaches a pressure of 10,000 pounds per square inch, a rupture valve breaks and propels a 15-gram projectile down the launch tube. The pressure in the acceleration reservoir continues to rise to well over 100,000 psi. The piston extrudes into the acceleration reservoir, creating a seal. At the end of the launch tube, the projectile enters the secondary confinement chamber, from which all air has been evacuated. This chamber is eight feet in diameter and serves as a secondary barrier against any release of material to the environment. At this point, the projectile is traveling up to eight kilometers per second, or 18,000 miles per hour. For comparison, this speed is approximately 10 times faster than a bullet from a standard hunting rifle. As the projectile travels through a free flight zone, a continuous wave X-ray system detects the projectile. This system serves as the primary trigger for both the diagnostic and confinement systems. The two flash X-rays photograph the projectile in flight. Both the time between the flashes and distance traveled by the projectile are measured to an accuracy of more than 99.9%. This information allows the experimenter to precisely determine the projectile velocity. The projectile then passes through the ultra-fast closure valve system this system closes within 80 microseconds to prevent material from escaping. Receiving a signal from the continuous wave X-ray system, 12 detonators ignite a layer of high explosives surrounding a soft aluminum tube. The explosives symmetrically crush the tube, creating a seal and isolating the target material. 
When the projectile hits the target, the impact produces a high pressure shock wave millions of times the atmospheric pressure at Earth's surface. Okay, so the reason you do this, um, that's how it works, is that instead of running an explosion with an, ex you know, with a, an explosive charge, or whatever, there, there can be a lot of um, error or uncertainty associated with how much energy is in an explosive detonation and, and how well coupled it is. In this case, you understand very precisely the, um, that projectile, you know, it's, it's, you know its speed very precisely. It's just kinetic energy at that point, and it's very easy to know exactly what the, uh, what the, the force and function is. And then I, I, at that point, in one of the measurements we do there is we simply measure shock propagation speed. So that's all also very easy to measure. So I'm able to know very precisely um, the shock speed and which tells me a lot about the material properties and, and so anyway, but that's, that's what we do at Jasper. And, uh, and so it allows us to really hone in and get plutonium specific data. Um, so anyway, that's, that's Jasper and it, it is, it, it is a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it works, you know, it, you know, I can't think of the word, but um, anyway, it, it, it feeds data to help people when they do the integral experiments that we do at U1A, with, which has more explosive drive, because now I can, I can separate out the plutonium performance and I can just measure or look at the effects of everything else. So anyway, let's go to the next slide. Okay, um, another, another capability that we're, we're working on right now, and this goes back, we're, I apologize, a little bit of a diversion there to bring Jasper in, because Jasper is not a subcritical ex experiment um, capability, but now we're back to subcritical experiments. Um, the, div, de, the dense plasma focus is a, is a, is a, it's a machine, or it's a, it's a capability that really will ultimately be a diagnostic. Uh, for us, um, so we are using a, a high power or pulsed electrical power to generate a high in, uh, intensity burst of neutrons, and with that neutron neutron burst, if 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 seeded into um, a subcritical experiment at the right time, it can tell you a lot about the performance of of that device, and so. This is what um, this is one of these things that we're working on today. It's being developed here uh, in collaboration with Los Alamos and Livermore. I think it's with Livermore too. Am I right, or just Los Alamos? It's just Los Alamos, I think, actually. So, but working together to to, to uh, put this uh, put this together, and it will be another tool that will be part of that that final UNA underground laboratory that we're really excited about. So let's go to the next slide. Um, Part of, part of what we do as well is, is, has to do with developing modern diagnostics and, uh, and, and making sure that we're able to interrogate and measure the kind of things that the laboratories need to have, need to have done. So you get, you get a pretty good look there at the kind of things that we're looking at, temperature, molecular atomic spectroscopy, you know, shock, you know, Shock analysis, shock physics analysis. Uh, um, if you shock something, it, material flies off of it. That's we call that ejecta. Uh, the ejecta pr production and transport. It's so a lot of different things that we're looking at. They're actually rather challenging um, to measure. One way one way to think about it is if you're using a laser diagnostic, which we do because you, these things are very fast. Um, if you have uh, uh, if you have this uh, if you have this objective the spray, well, you start wondering um, what what is a surface that you're actually looking at? Okay, is the laser is going to bounce off a surface. Well, what exactly is the surface? So you need to understand the particle spray that's coming off so that you know exactly what the laser is actually looking at. So it's that, 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 those kind of challenging things that are going on that, that continue to, uh, um, that the scientists at the National Library continue to want to look at and understand better. So anyway, this is a lot of what we do today. Uh, a lot of our scientists and engineers are working on these things. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, keep going. All right, so I, I hit most of, the, most of these things, but uh, I think the key things uh, uh, here are, is the takeaway bullet on the bottom is that our capabilities and our resources 
really are enabling work that can't be done anywhere else in the United States. This is the only place where this kind of work can be done um, for, for a number of different reasons. And so as you look at um, some of the challenges that we face today, return of competitive uh, co or competition between great powers. For a long time, the United States was without peers, and now we worry that, that, that peers are starting to uh, return. Okay? Um, you know, the, Russia will turn over its stockpile in the next five years or so. We'll have brand new, and you know, we're we're in life extension programs. You know, so it's a it's a very you know, it's, a, it's a challenging world out there. And so these are the things we're trying to do to make sure that the nation remains or keeps its deterrent capability. Let's let me walk away feared, afraid for what I just said. Uh, the head of Stratcom was asked when, he's the one that mentioned this, when he was asked, uh, would you trade our weapons for theirs? And he said, no, I'll still keep ours. So we're, we're, not, we're not too bad a shape. Um, so, uh, you know, the increased role of nuclear weapons and military strategies when the Russians came out and went with a low yield weapon. And that, that, is, that idea is one where you can look at and you say, that means they might actually use it. You know, and so that was a little scary. Um, the uncertainties regarding future global security, um, that's a little bit scary. You know, other countries, you know, North Korea, Iran, other ones um, that make us a little bit nervous. And then, um, uh, well, that's part of the prolifer proliferation. And so what we are, again, is key to making sure that we're, we can maintain our deterrent in a safe, secure, and compliant way. And so that's what we're about doing. Let's go to the next one. Slide. Um, you get to see the different areas we're interested in. Stockpile stewardship, I've talked a lot about global security. Um, we, uh, we do quite a bit of work there. Uh, um, the infrastructure and, and readiness. Um, um, we have to maintain the capability to resume. We're not resuming underground testing, but we have to maintain the capability to do that. That's actually a deterrent um, in and of itself. And so the, if we were not able to return to testing in some reasonable amount of time, uh, some of our deterrent capability starts to go away. So, um, and so all this is uh, national security work and work that we're involved with out at the NNSS. Let's go to the next slide. All right, this is this super cool machine that we're putting underground. It's, um, this is back to UNA. This is the major workhorse of the future. It's called the Enhanced Capabilities for Subcritical Experiments. We call it ECSE. Uh, it's a, uh, this, is the, um, uh, this is the linear accelerator that will allow us to do multi-shot, uh, you know, multi-picture uh, of an implosion. And this is going to be a workhorse once in put in place. This is probably 30 years worth of experimental work that, that can be done there. So it's an anchor in the, it, it's sort of, it becomes, what's the term in a mall? Your anchor tenant, you know, whatever. But this becomes an anchor tenant for the Nevada National Security Site. We're very excited about this. It's a billion dollars class uh, piece of equipment that's going underground. So really excited about that. We've, you know, obviously, it, requires a lot of crafts, a lot, you know, so we need miners, we need electricians, we need plumbers, we need all sorts of workers, we'll need scientists, we need engineers, we're collaborating with our local universities, all those things come together to make this stuff, make this a reality, and, and especially as we have to have people who are going to run this and, and do the work. So really excited about this, a lot, of, a lot about jobs, a lot about good jobs, a lot about great national security opportunities. So let's go to the next slide. Um, infrastructure. Uh, I mentioned that we're in a growth mode here. A couple of things, um, okay, I'm, I'm getting close to the end. So a couple of things, you know, early on when you're, when you're on the, this is the, the test site itself, um, when, when you have explosives, you usually don't want buildings right next to each other, because if you had a mistake in one building, you'll take out the one next to it. And so, you know, we have things spread all over the place. Now you fast forward, many years and now um, you know the you know you look at this and I go well now I gotta have power I gotta have water you know to all these different places and so one of the things we've been looking out there is building infrastructure and try to align things along what we call the mercury corridor so this modernization uh, will be very effective for us and uh, but it is it is a significant investment by the the Department of Energy or the NNSA 
uh, as we go forward. This is where we start looking at, you know, over the next 10 years or so, over probably close to a billion dollars worth of infrastructure investment here, which can be cool jobs, okay? So you can see the you know, facilities, infrastructure, critical site support, so we're really excited about that. And, and uh, really grateful to uh, our, you know, the leadership in, within NNSA that has recognized this and has, has you know, gone off and made the case to Congress to, to fund these kind of things. It's really exciting. Let's go to the next, next slide. Okay, uh, Mercury is the place where uh, that's the uh, sort of the hub of activities. That uh, you know, this is the first place you get to uh, when you turn off on to the Mercury Highway to go to the test site. Um, so we're modernizing that, and we're modernizing it in some clever ways. We do we are trying to make uh, green facilities out there. Right now we have, I think we were first in the nation to have a fully green. Is that right, Darwin? Yeah, we were first in the nation, our fire department, new building out there, completely powered by solar power, you know, green. We're trying to be uh, smart, you know, good, good, uh, um, good for the environment uh, kind of approach here. But build a campus that will attract the best and brightest. I mean, that's one of the challenges I have right now is how do I attract the next generation of best and brightest as we want to have the kind of collaborative environment here where they can come, work, and are excited and, and can do the kind of things that they need to do. Let's go to the next slide. All right, uh, in the forward areas, I kind of talked about this a little bit. Uh, it's more of the growth that we're doing out there is trying to get things onto this Mercury corridor. We're focusing on a couple areas right now. Uh, obviously, we need to, if you were to go out to U1A, if you weren't, if you didn't go below ground, actually when you go below ground, it's far more sophisticated than it is above ground. Until recently, it was dirt roads and, and trailers. And so uh, we've paved in the roads there. Again, dust is your enemy. So trying to drive the dust down. Uh, we're building new buildings to go in there. We need to have laboratory space. We need to have uh, classified capa operations capabilities. We need to have uh, you know, the laboratories are coming out here and doing the work. We need to have hoteling capabilities for them. I'm not, I'm not talking about a place to spend the night. I'm talking a place, about a place where they can plug in their computers and do the kind of work that they need to do. Um, so we're building all that right now at UNA. It's very exciting. We also are building, uh, we need support for those at the DAF. That's our, that's our major plutonium facility out there. It's the hub of activities that's, that we have out there. And so that a lot of work going on there. So and then the other infrastructure. Let's keep going here. Um, next slide. Okay, so this this is my evidence of why it's a billion dollars over the next ten years. This is kind of growth, and these are the different things that we're putting in. You know, DAF building one, UNA building two, Mercury building four, and you got to see real. This is this is the plan. Real things that are going on, and uh, again, very exciting future for uh, for the test site and. Uh, and the things that we're doing in, in, here in July, in next July, we have what's called the NA50 deep dive, where we come out and, and the program people, the people that are actually, NA50 is the organization that has the infrastructure dollars, but they won't invest money anywhere unless the program side of the house or the people that own the you know, stockpile stewardship mission, they have to come out and say, that's important. And so, you know, this is obviously a really important uh, event for us, but, we have been very successful because the, the nation has come to say, we need Nevada, we need Nevada to do this. This is the only way we're going to be able to do our life extension programs and complete the, uh, the very challenging missions that we have and maintain the, the, the deterrent posture for this nation. So Nevada is in the middle of all this. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so we're getting to the end here. SDRD program. So in addition to the core mission that we have here, uh, we, we have a program called Site-Directed Research and Development Program. And in this, what we, what we allow our scientists to do is, is go off and work on things that may be a little more high risk. We don't know if it's necessarily going to work out or some new idea uh, that maybe people are saying, well, that sounds interesting to me. Develop it a little bit more, and then we'll, we'll see if we're willing to pay for it. So I have some money that we can, we can use to... Um, to support new ideas and new concepts. SRD, SRD feasibility studies allow us to rapidly explore concepts, try it, succeed, or fail fast. That's kind of the idea. And so um, 
Uh, it also helps, you know, when we go out recruiting to get the, the bright people, this is a great uh, recruiting element for us. And by the way, we do have some, uh, some of our SDRD work is actually uh, supporting some work that's going on at UNLV here close by as well as UNR. So, um, so anyway, it's, it's a, good, it's a good, uh, uh, good opportunity and our scientists do quite well with it. Let's go to the next slide. So well that for our size, we are extraordinarily good at the R&D 100 award. The R&D 100 award is, is the Academy Award for um, Research and Development. Um, the, lab, the national laboratories are there, uh, industries there from around the world, and our scientists have done very, very well. You can kind of see these are our winners. And uh, on, when I look at the amount of scientists that we have compared to the laboratories, on a percentage basis, we do we do quite nicely. So we're very proud of the, of the, the, the technical contributions that our work is, is doing. And I mean, some of this stuff is just kind of cool, you know, muon detectors and, uh, you know, st stuff like that. But anyway, um, this uh, fisheye villa symmetry probe was just revolutionary. I mean, just those kind of things are really cool and drive, <coughs> drive change for us. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, in addition to this, we also, are trying to reach out and, and, and encourage the next generation of scientists and engineers and uh, people involved with STEM. And so you can see here, uh, we're reaching out into the high schools. Um, we, uh, this is a picture at the, at the Science Bowl. I, that's right, Science Bowl. That's me there and I don't know where I was. Um, so um, yeah, at the Science Bowl. Uh, it's really exciting to meet the next gen generation of kids. These, these kids are they're so bright and they're so excited and so enthused. It's really fun. Uh, also, we um, uh, we support the we're a big participant in, in First Robotics in Nevada First, um, and uh, you know we are we're actually helping a couple teams go to the finals uh, that couldn't afford it otherwise. And so uh, we're really excited about that. And they'll be able to go out. How many how many schools? Made it to the finals, seven local? Nine. nine, nine local schools. And how many could afford to go? All of them because we helped. <laughs> so we're helping them get there. So, but it's really, it's, it's really cool, as, uh, you know, I'm able to participate with that and it's just a lot of fun to see this. If you've never been to a FIRST Robotics competition, it's, it is just outrageously fun. Um, see, the, it's, it's like, the robot wars almost, so it's, it's really fun. The, and the kids get so excited about it. And so the, the region, one of the regional, comp, well, a regional competition for California is here. And so it's kind of cool. Let's go to the next slide. I'm going to conclude with this a little video and then uh, let's watch this video and then I'm done. Every day when I come to work, our country is stronger and the world is safer. Good morning, ma'am. How are you? Good. Right. Do you have any prohibited articles? Nope. All right. You have a great day. Thank right. you. Thank you. Whatever your job is, you do national security. My work helps keep America safe. I'm proud of what I do. I'm proud of what I do. Our mission is our name. And our name is our mission. Our soldiers and first responders are trained and ready because of me. When our military needs reliability, that's where I come in. Everyone on the team works for national security. My work makes a difference. The work we do is a backbone of freedom. Across the country and around the world. I'm not a scientist, but I still work on national security. Freedom-loving people all over the country depend on me. Nothing is more important to our country than national security. That's why I do what I do every day. I work every day so all Americans can sleep at night. Our military and first responders keep our country free. And I've got their back. Our mission is national security, and the mission belongs to me. And 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 me. You and me. I love that video because that's really who we are. We're about national security. I, I, you know, there's a mention there of first responders. We have trained over 200,000 first responders. What, are we, what number are we up to now? Does anybody know 220,000 or something like that? Uh, these are the people that um, in the event of a, uh, a 
radioactive contamination or something. These are the people that are going to go in and, and pull people out and save lives. And we have, um, we have data that says that before they show up, if they were offered to go to a chemical spill or a radiological spill, which one would they rather go to? And without exception, they say, I'll go to a chemo. I'm not going to a rad. We bring them in. We teach them. We teach them what their, um, um, what their PPE does and how to deal with it. And when they're done, they're perfectly confident, and, they're, and they actually say, no, I, I know what to do here. I, I'll go to, I'll respond. And we know that, that in real-life real cases that that makes a difference, that we have people across this nation who will go into harm's way with now knowing how, now knowing how to protect themselves and protect other people. So real cool stuff. So with that, next slide. Okay, we're there. Any questions I can artfully dodge? Great. Sure. Now, uh, we have a lot of nuclear activity going on in the commercial sector. Companies like General Atomics are doing nuclear you know, mini reactors, 100 megawatt type reactors. <coughs> but I would imagine they have to test them out in the process. So, so um, there are some, we've done some reactor work. There's a uh, real interesting video if you want to go look at it. It's, um, it really is a takeoff of the, uh, of, well, it's called, I think the video is called Krusty still, but it's a kilopower reactor. Uh, this is a, um, a reactor that was designed by Los Alamos, but it was tested in the DAF. But this is, if, you're, if you saw the movie The Martian, um, this is probably your best chance of being able to um, deploy an energy source on the moon or Mars or something like that, which if you go to Mars, there's plenty of resources there that just don't have the energy to get. I mean, there's oxygen, there's, I mean, but how do you get, how do you get the fuel and everything? That, that's, a, that's a 50 kilowatt at most reactor. Yeah, this one, it's a 10-ish 10, 10 and you, you chain them together. We have been, you know, people have asked us about doing bigger ones. It's really not our core mission. Uh, it's not to say that we can't do it, uh, but this is an NNSA site, and, and reactors are really nuclear. Um, Where else can you test them? Well, Idaho. Idaho is really the, is the place where you would probably go, and that's the, traditionally where, where that work has been done. Um, certain cases, you know, we, we would look at, and uh, we, would, we could do some here. Uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, the military bases around us are interested as well, and they talk to us about that because they need uh, reliable power, yeah. So, but we, uh, I mean, it's not our core mission, but we, it'd be, it's something we have, we have some capabilities of testing with, so. No, good question, though, thank you. Anything else? Oh, in the back, yes. Now the, the site is uh, acquiring or restricting some access to Desert National Wildlife Refuge currently. Um, I was just curious if that's part of the, the upgrading and streamlining that you guys are working on and connecting to different sites. So I, we're restricting access to who? Desert National Wildlife Refuge. Hmm. I, I, honestly, I, I, don't, I, I don't know the answer to that. Do you know the answer to that, Darwin? Yes, sir. We are not. It's the Air Force. It's the Air Force. Okay. <coughs> yeah. So, so that's one thing to keep in mind is that the the test range is different than us. We get we get con, we get confused in that because I, I was unaware of us you know denying or restricting access. Obviously, we're going through a lot of work with the Historical Preservation Act, and as we do the the as we upgrade, we're trying to make sure we preserve the nation's history. And uh, capabilities there. We do have uh, uh, DRI on site, you know, doing all sorts of stuff, and you know, so we we do our best to try to accommodate that. Okay. Thank you. Good question, though. It's one I didn't know the answer to. <laughs> Any other ones? Well, thank you so much for bearing with me. It's been a lot of fun to be here with you tonight. And we want to thank you. Small gift. Ah. From the National Atomic Testing Museum. We also want to thank MSTS because you've given, underwritten $5,000 to help bring field trips out here, and we're getting a lot more school kids now to our field trips, and we really appreciate that. And of course, you gave us a $25,000 <laughs> sponsorship to help our programming, and this came is out one of my check, um, checkbook well, directly. Well, so. It's very much appreciated. No, we appreciate it. We, we are committed to the next generation. 
He's um, one of our this, volunteers. This is, uh, <laughs> this is the future, and we want them to be interested in science and technology, and hence, the, whatever free energy we have, we try to, what, you know, that's our focus. So thank you for being here, buddy. We thank you. Thank you. Okay. No. Thank you. Excellent, excellent talk.